afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Before I start, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people, who are the traditional owners of the country from where I speak to you today. I also want to acknowledge you at Nungars, on whose country I conducted this study. I pay my respect to the elders, past, present, and emerging. As Martin said, in this talk, I will present the results of a study that looked at fluorivory in Dryandra. And this is part of a larger project uh, that is intended to address a broader question, which is, are fluoriferous insects important for the evolution of floral traits in Dryandra, which is genus Banksia in Proteaceae? So first, for a bit of background, the dominant paradigm in pollination ecology is that floral traits evolve under selection to maximize the efficiency of pollen transfer between the flowers. And so we expect different pollinators to drive evolution of different floral types. But it is increasingly recognized that antagonistic interactions, such as fluorivory, uh, are also very important. And my PhD project investigates pollination ecology in a group of banksias uh, called the dryandras, some of which you are seeing on this slide. They used to be considered a separate genus, but they are a radiation within banksia and are now treated as a, a clade, technically a series within that genus. There's about 90 species of them. All are endemic to Western Australia. And as a group, they are extremely diverse in their flora traits, as I hope you can appreciate from the, the photos on the slide. So, apologies for the delay. Uh, my main focus are the vertebrate pollinators. Uh, so nectarivorous birds and small mammals, such as uh, the honey possum, uh, which I hope you can see. Uh, but I'm also looking at insects uh, and hoping to test whether the differences in the floral traits among the dryandras can be explained by their putatively different pollination systems. So, but while I was in the field, I noticed that a lot of the inflorescences that I was looking at were damaged, which uh, made me think that I should also, oh, apologies, there's, there's a lag in my slide, I'm sure. Uh, which made me think that I should also look at an alternative hypothesis uh, that their floral traits in these plants are under selection to avoid being eaten by uh, insects. And as it turns out, there's uh, not much that is known about fluorivory in Banksia and less still in Dryandra. So I decided uh, to start by collecting some basic ecological data. So, my aims here were to record the types of floral damage and to quantify their frequency in four dryandras, shown here on the right, and to consider the differences in the context of their floral traits and reproductive strategies. So there are some similarities as well as differences uh, in, in, in the species that you are seeing here. Uh, which may or may not be important for their pollination and avoidance of floral damage. Uh, and they also differ in their uh, reproductive strategies, of which I will speak more uh, a bit later. Right, so importantly, all of these species co-occur in a small area and their flowering overlaps in uh, late July. And the map on the right here shows the location of my study site, which was at Haivali uh, Farm, which is a private floral reserve uh, about 250 kilometers north of Perth. Um, and my, my method uh, consisted of counting all inflorescences for these species in uh, quadrats, uh, 10 by 20 meters, uh, and then scoring the uh, damaged inflorescences towards the end of the flowering season for each of the species. Uh, so this photo uh, shows one of my quadrats. Uh, apologies for the delay. Um, Uh, 
Yeah, so this photo shows one of my quarters with uh, Banks Eschaté Wardiana indicated by the arrow uh, in the foreground. So I hope that this also gives you some uh, landscape context to the study. So this is uh, an open heath or quongan, uh, which is, uh, these are some of the most diverse plant communities in the world uh, with very high uh, species diversity of plants and also very high endemism. Uh, so of the study species that I looked at, uh, Banksia catoglypta is a threatened rare species and only occurs at this site. Right, last thing I should uh, explain uh, for anyone uh, who may not be familiar with these plants uh, is the basic structure of the inflorescence. Uh, so they resemble a brush and each bristle, if you like, is an individual flower. Uh, and like in all Proteaceae, uh, the pollen is secondarily presented on the distal parts uh, of, the, of, of the style. So where the arrows are pointing and so it's a bit like corn on the cob. And uh, after that is removed, the stigma, which is at the tip of the uh, styles, uh, it opens and becomes receptive to uh, foreign pollen so the plant can be uh, pollinated. Uh, so, so these in the middle are unopened flowers. Right, so uh, let's review the types of damage that I observed. Uh, so there will be four of them. The first one that you are seeing here, um, these are different flowers, but you can see them as a, as a, as a sequence. So uh, I hope you can, you can discern the silky cocoons and, and frass, uh, which are, this is consistent with the um, damage caused by Banksia boring moths, so family Tortricide. Uh, possibly uh, any of the species in Arotrophora uh, genus or a similar genus called Paraglyphis. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't observe any of the adults, uh, so this is the conjectural. I hope to confirm the ID next year. Um, and I have seen this damage on three out of four uh, of my study species, so not on Banksia catoglypta. <clears throat> so next. Uh, the second type of damage, uh, here the pollen presenters were uh, snipped off or chewed off. Um, and so this was common on all of the species uh, that I looked at. Then third, um, this was characteristic of Banksia catoglypta. So here the styles uh, in the center of the inflorescences were nipped off uh, by something with powerful jaws because these flowers are really tough. They almost feel like they are made of plastic. Uh, and they even managed to chew through the uh, organza bags that I was using in my pollination experiments. Uh, and then finally, uh, this, I only saw this once, uh, but possibly it occurs more, uh, happens more often. So this is on Banksia sessilis. Um, the ovules of the young flowers were eaten in a bad um, And for the frequency uh, of the damage, uh, so the, I think the, the most informative way to present uh, this kind of data is a simple bar chart. So here, each bar represents an individual plant and um, um, the, the height of the bars is the uh, number of the inflorescences on the plant and in blue are the damaged inflorescences. The numbers indicate the proportion uh, that were damaged in one way or another for each species. Uh, so I think it's clear from the chart that there's some variation in the number of inflorescences produced and the proportion of the inflorescences that were damaged, uh, both per plant and per species. Um, in absolute terms, the fewest inflorescences were damaged on Banksia shutterwardiana on the right, uh, largely because most plants didn't have any, uh, and uh, most were damaged on uh, Banksia uh, sessilis and Banksia catoglypta. Uh, so I did 
I, I did a chi-square test on this, which was significant, but uh, I don't think that this is particularly enlightening because this was not a controlled experiment and there's a lot of um, confounding variables here, uh, but still I think it's interesting to consider the differences between these species in the context of the reproductive uh, strategies and, and the floral traits, which is what I'm going to do uh, now quickly. Uh, So first thing, uh, which is hard to show in the photos, is that the inflorescences on Banks of Cecilis are smaller and rather flimsy uh, compared to other uh, species here, uh, uh, whereas uh, Catoglypta was particularly tough and, and, and rigid. Uh, also, um, the plants differed in uh, how conspicuous or hidden were the inflorescences. So uh, in Banks of Cecilis, they are very easy to see from a distance, whereas uh, Banks of Chateauwardiana was particularly uh, cryptic. Um, and this one, in terms of reproductive strategies, uh, this one stands out in that most of the plants did not have any flowers, but they were not juvenile plants. They were mature shrubs. Uh, and clearly had some flowers before and produced some seeds before. Uh, so I think this makes sense if you consider that this is the only species here with a lignin tuber, which means that it can re-sprout after fire and so does not rely on seed for regeneration. The other species are non lignin tubers, so presumably rely on seeds to regenerate after fire. Uh, moreover, these two species in the middle uh, are strongly serotonous, so they do not release their seeds. Um, and keep them in those woody follicles uh, until fire, whereas the other two are only weakly serotonous, so they generally release their seeds every year. So their fruits are smaller and less protected, uh, but there's generally more of them. Uh, so the, the photos here show um, past year's fruit, which are all open. Um, so I will now summarize what I've just told you. Um, so I presented the data on insect damage to flowers on four species of Dryandra, which are co-flowering at a single location. And I compared and contrasted uh, some of the floral traits and reproductive strategies of this species. Uh, and what I think we can draw out of this uh, little study is, that of course, even though I only scratched the surface here, I think this shows that um, if you look at this visual summary, there is a large amount of ecological interactions uh, that are occurring there that are uh, small and elusive, and we know very little about them, uh, but they are important, not least because florivorous insects have the potential, as uh, my data shows, to directly impact on reproduction and particularly on the serotonous and seed dependent species, uh, particularly here in uh, Banksia catoglypta. Uh, so to address my main question, are florivorous insects important for uh, the evolution of flora traits? I think the answer is probably yes, but it's very complicated and there will be uh, many other things that will uh, influence that and uh, trade-offs and evolutionary constraints uh, that need to be considered. Uh, so very quickly, uh, future research that I'm intending to do, uh, next year I hope to ID the insects and add that on fruit set and fruit damage uh, to get a fuller picture of uh, the impacts that insects uh, have on reproduction of these plants. Uh, and I think it would be great to also investigate the chemical defenses in these species and uh, the broader ecology uh, of these insects. Uh, so how they fit in the uh, trophic, uh, uh, trophic chains. Um, yeah, with that, I would like to uh, finish and thank you for your attention. Uh, many thanks to my supervisors and uh, to the Ecological Society of Australia for supporting my project. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that, Stan. Really interesting. Um, we probably don't have time for uh, questions, so um, direct your questions to Stan uh, via the chat privately, if you like. And we'll move right along. Um, now